Uh, welcome everyone to the Municipal Summit on Building Decarbonization and Advancing Clean Energy Codes on March 3rd, 2020. Uh, we are Sustainable Westchester and this program is supported by NYSERDA. Sustainable Westchester is a consortium of member municipalities. We have 45 member municipalities and the county itself. And our role is to support our member municipalities in their journey towards sustainability leadership. We are their partner through programs like Westchester Power, Commercial Clean Heating and Cooling, and Community Solar. And we help them to navigate federal, state, and local programs to set and achieve sustainability goals. Today, our agenda can be broken down into two sections. The first hour where we'll hear about market transformation, the built environment's role in our clean energy future from Nina Orville, Executive Director of Sustainable Westchester. Advancing Clean Energy Codes, Building Decarbonization in New York from Chris Corcoran, Program Manager, Codes, Products and Standards Team with NYSERDA and Chris Roy, Senior Project Manager, Codes, Products and Standards Team with NYSERDA. Then we'll go into our featured panel Municipal Perspectives of Adopting New York Stretch 2020 with our moderator, Jen Metzger, PhD, former state senator and New Yorkers for Clean Power Senior Policy Advisor. Our panelists include Mayor Bramson of the City of New Rochelle, uh, Commissioner Vaca with the City of New Rochelle, Supervisor Calvis from the Town of Bedford, and Mark Tealking, the Director of Energy and Sustainability with the Town of Bedford. In the second hour, we'll go into the benefits of adopting New York Stretch guidance and toolkit from Josh Stack, New York Stretch circuit rider, builder and resiliency services. Then the municipal discussion with our new adopters and a special video from a code official. I, Rachel Carpatella, the program director with Sustainable Westchester will be moderating this municipal discussion with Supervisor Lucas from the town of North, North Salem and Supervisor Levenberg from the town of Ossining. And that special video from building inspector Minozzi from the village of Hastings on Hudson. Then we'll go into our question and answer section where we look forward to addressing all of your questions. Our first talk is from Nina Orville. Uh, Nina was named executive director of Sustainable Westchester in February of 2021. Nina is working toward, toward forwarding the organization's bold vision of clean energy and sustainability to continue to serve as a model in New York State and beyond, with a sharp focus on, redressing, on addressing environmental inequities across the diverse county. Prior to her current position, Nina led Sustainable Westchester solar programs, including community solar and commercial solar acceleration. She previously directed the celebrated Solarized Westchester program with rooftop solar campaigns in partnership with 22 municipalities. Nina was also instrumental in the launch of the Heat Smart Westchester program, which brings clean heating solutions to Westchester communities. Welcome, Nina. Thank you, Rachel. Good morning, everybody. We're so thrilled to have over 350 people registered for this event. And I would like to offer special thanks to NYSERDA for supporting both today's event and the broader scope of work that we're doing here at Sustainable Westchester to learn about New York stretch adoption processes and considerations here in Westchester. NYSERDA's codes and standards team has been a really wonderful partner in this work. And I'd like to thank Chris Corcoran and Chris Sproy for their support. And I would also like to give a special thanks to Anila Cherian for her generous and insightful collaboration. Thanks to, to the Sustainable Westchester team, Maria Genovese and Rachel Carpatella for their work to organize this. We've been really pleased at Sustainable Westchester to engage former state senator and clean energy expert Jen Metzger in this New York stretch work that we're undertaking. You'll have the opportunity to hear from her shortly when she moderates the featured panel. And I also want to thank all of our panelists today with special thanks to our elected officials and other municipal representatives for their really inspiring leadership. In New York State, 
Buildings are our largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, accounting for about one third of all emissions. Clearly, we can't achieve New York's climate goals without successfully addressing them. In fact, to reach our goals, we need to improve and decarbonize up to 2 million buildings statewide by 2030. In Westchester alone, that translates to upgrading and decarbonizing over 80,000 properties to achieve the county's share of the statewide goal. Sustainable Westchester and other organizations run outreach programs to offer a streamlined path to improved performance for individual property owners. In Westchester, the most successful programs have resulted in perhaps a thousand or so upgrades over a period of several years. So while these programs are very important to build demand and familiarity with new technologies and approaches, it's clear we'll never achieve the necessary scale of change through voluntary individual action. Ultimately, we need updated building codes, alignment of public service regulations, and significant financial support for the required transition to resource efficient electrification of our buildings. Importantly, improving building performance also provides significant operational savings and health benefits. Replacing on site combustion of fossil fuels removes pollutants and safety hazards, and advanced building codes ensure efficiency and performance. When we improve our buildings, we future-proof them. We increase property values and we make healthier spaces, which is really a win for everybody. New York State is currently creating a plan, as many of you um, no doubt know, to achieve the climate and environmental equity goals in the state's climate law. That plan will include timelines for all electric building codes, a phase out of heating equipment and appliances that rely on fossil fuel combustion and more. This is gonna require a very accelerated scaling up of the clean energy workforce. And the building sector alone is projected to account for over half of new clean energy jobs added over the next decade. The state's plan will also be responsive to the needs of low and moderate income residents to reduce costs, emissions, and public health harms from fossil fuel combustion. In the meantime, before the broader plan is finalized and adopted, forward-thinking municipalities have the opportunity to adopt the New York Stretch Energy Code. NYSERDA is incentivizing municipalities through techno technical support and clean energy community points and grant funds to adopt New York Stretch. We're pleased as a Westchester-based organization that many adopters, one third of all statewide, are actually located here in Westchester. And you're gonna hear from a number of them today. They will share information or their perspectives on why they concluded New York Stretch was the right thing for their municipality. Insights regarding successful adoption uh, processes, and the training available for code enforcement officials, as well as community feedback that they received. I'm really pleased also that NYSERDA representatives are going to share information about other code related opportunities they're offering, a number of which offer designated funding, such as the third party support and advancing code compliance technology pilot program that will help communities digitize their permitting processes. It's also very important that NYSERDA is focused on equity concerns related to codes and standards. And that consideration is gonna be reflected, is reflected in some of the funding opportunities that you'll hear about. 
Sustainable Westchester is going to be offering learning opportunities to share the state's draft Climate Action Council scoping plan in the near future. One of the key topics will be buildings and the related discussion about codes and standards. We will also soon be sharing case studies of four municipalities prepared by Jen Metzger based on in-depth interviews with leaders in early adopting Westchester municipalities, many of whom you're gonna hear from shortly. So I'm so glad you're here with us today and I'm now gonna turn the program back to Rachel Carpitella. Our next talk is Advancing Clean Energy Codes, Building Decarbonization in New York from Chris Corcoran, Program Manager, Codes, Products and Standards Team with NYSERDA. At that team, he focuses on regulatory efficiency and decarbonization programs for New York State. The codes, products, and standards team works directly on building codes, appliance standards, benchmarking, and building labeling, helping to achieve broad-based greenhouse gas emissions reductions while also saving money for New Yorkers. Chris has been with NYSERDA for seven years, managing programs across technologies and building sectors. Prior to joining NYSERDA, Chris worked with several national utilities and service providers to expand efficiency offerings and help ratepayers reduce their monthly bills. Chris Roy is the Senior Project Manager on NYSERDA's Codes, Products, and Standards team. He has worked with NYSERDA for over 10 years, supporting energy code advancement efforts, as well as pro programs providing training, services, and resources designed to improve energy code compliance and enforcement. Currently, Chris manages NYSERDA's technical support for local adoption of New York Stretch Energy Code 2020, New York's first above minimum model energy code. Thank you, Rachel. Good morning, everybody. And thank you all for taking the time to join us this morning. Uh, I also wanna thank, uh, thank Nina and the team at, West, at Sustainable Westchester, all of our speakers, uh, such an amazing group and panel of, of speakers. Um, and especially uh, Anila Cherian from our team uh, for making this event possible. Uh, it was a lot of work, uh, and I think you'll really, I, hopefully you'll learn a, a lot as we go through. From my side, seeing this level of interest uh, and knowing that Westchester communities have consistently been leaders in clean energy, sustainability, climate smart actions, uh, it really gives me hope um, as we look down this road. Uh, it, we have got a lot to do, but together we can make it happen. As Nina mentioned, and as you can see on this slide, New Yorkers and, and New York State are on an aggressive path uh, to dramatically cut greenhouse gas emissions uh, throughout our economy by mid-century. The CLCPA, or Climate Act, uh, set our course and our goals, and we have uh, a number of interim goals uh, and, and reduction requirements that are coming up just a few years from now. Uh, we can we can look ahead and, and know that, that codes and, and uh, standards are gonna be a key piece of, of this effort. These changes um, are gonna reduce energy costs and they're, at the same time, they're gonna improve health outcomes um, and they're going and across the state. So we know that there are, there are multiple benefits uh, across the board. And we also know that this is a, the Climate Act is gonna benefit all New Yorkers. This isn't just about you know, one community or the other, we know that at least 35% of the benefits are going to go to disadvantaged communities, uh, which is which is so important as we as we look ahead. But as always, this starts at the local level. Uh, you know, municipalities like yours um, have been leading the way for years, um, and your direct actions are going to be essential as we look ahead uh, and continue these this to reach these goals. Next slide. As Nina mentioned, buildings are essential and central to this effort and, and improving improving them is core to what we're going to need to do to hit our GHG reduction requirements. Uh, buildings do account for about a third of, of our uh, GHG emissions, as you can see here, uh, through burning of fossil fuels to heat air, water, food, cool our spaces. Uh, across the board, we've got, you know, we have a lot of emissions uh, emissions from from these from the built environment. But we also know this is a significant opportunity. The technologies we have now can help us reduce these, these emissions um, and cut them and move to decarbonize uh, uh, buildings very quickly. 
That said, uh, energy efficiency is still the first best and most cost-effective tool it, for improving buildings in our toolbox. Uh, buildings that are designed right from the beginning, buildings that are built right from the beginning um, are future-proof. Um, they are you know, going to provide energy savings, health impacts, um, and benefits throughout their lifetime. So we're talking you know, 30, 50, 100 years of benefits uh, as if we do it right at the start. And advanced codes like New York Stretch 2020 really help make this kind of construction the standard. Uh, this is this is is setting the minimum, uh, but also really pushing pushing forward to make sure that we can enable decarbonized buildings as we look ahead. If you look at in the next slide, our team here at NYSERDA um, is really here to help. The local actions that you take um, are going to make all of this possible. Um, and as we as we look ahead, we want to help support broad compliance. Um, and we do that through training, tools, resources, um, and funding uh, directly. Uh, most of the talk today is going to focus on New York Stretch. Um, that's, and I think that's really important, and it's it's critical uh, first step. But we have a number of other opportunities that are they're at hand uh, that we can help directly fund these changes and help make your your municipalities uh, or help your municipalities improve code compliance. Um, and increase consistency across the board. Uh, at the end of last year, we launched a, a third party compliance initiative. Um, it's, the goal here is really to help municipalities adopt and implement third party support for plan reviews and inspections. Uh, this is something that's done in other codes. We want to transfer it over into energy code. And we know as codes advance, uh, the, the burden is even more on, on code officials. So this is the idea here is to really help uh, to qualify third party experts and provide funding for communities directly to start to implement these. Um, and importantly, this is this is uh, you know, set aside 35% of funding for disadvantaged communities um, in this space. We've also uh, we've also are offering an opportunity for online permitting systems. Um, this is something that helps code officials and builders uh, to get that consistency move from paper to electronics um, and really make sure that, that uh, there's consistency and transparency in the process. Together, these two initiatives have about $2 million available um, and, and, and are you know, a, a, an important tool. We're also helping them make the next step around stretch to zero. Um, we're, our pro, we just launched a, a program that has $2.6 million available uh, to help uh, communities make that next step beyond efficiency and go to an all electric greenhouse get zero greenhouse gas emissions code uh, by December uh, 2023. All this is to say that we're here uh, to help, and we want to talk and we want to work with you. Um, as we, as I said before, you know, your communities in Westchester have always been leaders on climate issues. Um, we were here to partner with you. We want to, we want to help you, and we're eager, eager to help uh, reach these shared goals. So, with that, I want to thank you all again, um, and I want to hand it over to Chris Stroy to talk a bit more about New York Stretch. Thanks, Chris. Um, I hope everybody can hear me okay. So again, my name is Chris Roy. I'm a senior project manager at NYSERDA on the codes, products, and standards team. And I am uh, managing this effort on New York Stretch 2020 outreach and technical support for communities like many of those on this call. So um, I'll try to keep my um, slides here brief because I wanna be respectful of really what is the, um, the meat and potatoes of, this, of today's webinar. Um, and hearing from municipalities that have adopted in their, their experiences. But just to start, uh, I want to touch on briefly what New York Stretch Energy Code is and what it's, what it's meant to achieve. Um, so New York, Stretch is, New York Stretch 2020 is a readily adoptable local energy code. It's a, it's a supplement to the state's energy code, meaning it amends existing state energy code requirements and it adds to them with new requirements. Uh, it was developed by a public-private stakeholder group, which was managed by NYSERDA, and um, it also underwent a public review period. Um, ultimately, on average, New York Stretch 2020 saves, uh, well, well, improves the efficiency of buildings by 7% among commercial buildings and about 21% among residential buildings. And that is uh, an incremental improvement in efficiency above the state's energy code. 
Um, overall, we find that New York Stretch 2020, on average, they, uh, it, it represents a one to two percent incremental cost increase uh, for new buildings. Again, above building to the state's energy code alone. Um, and overall, it has a it has a um, competitive payback for you know, as few as five years for single family buildings. Um, and ultimately, um, New York Stretch is adoptable um, as a more restrictive local energy code, and that's authorized by Article 11 of New York State's energy law. Um, again, New York Stretch 2020 is meant to overlay the state energy code. It is not in and of itself a standalone energy code. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, we, the intent with New York Stretch is to take an incremental step forward beyond national model codes and beyond the state's energy code and to prepare municipalities that adopt it for future energy codes. It's intended to be roughly a, a one cycle stretch um, and, and roughly equivalent to a level of performance that we would expect to see for um, buildings built to the IECC 2021 national model standard. Um, New York Stretch 2020 is, it's an incremental step forward, but it is not um, paradigm shifting, meaning New York Stretch does not require builders to use new or un unavailable technologies or unfamiliar products. Um, it doesn't require using products that aren't currently available on today's shelves or construction techniques that will be unfamiliar to markets. Um, so it's really, you know, what we see as a, as a reasonable step forward. Uh, this slide just shows um, the history uh, over the last 20 years or so of efficiency improvements in represented by the national model code. So New York State adopts uh, a national model energy code developed by the ICC. Um, and between today's current code, which is based on the 2018 IECC and, um, and, the, and the most current national model code, which is the IECC 2021, uh, that represents roughly a 10% jump. So New York State today is, uses essentially the IECC 2018. Um, New York stretch, again, represents a level of performance that is roughly equivalent to the next model code, which is the IECC 2021. Um, as, as Chris and Nina mentioned, um, the building sector in, in New York State um, it, it represents roughly 30% or so of um, greenhouse gas emissions in the state of New York. And in terms of net energy use, um, buildings represent 50 to 60%. So, um, you know, as was already mentioned, the, the, the energy code and New York stretch represents um, an, essential, an essential piece in moving the state forward in decarbonizing and um, improving the efficiency of buildings, which will stand for decades. Uh, the Clean Energy Communities, my service Clean Energy Communities Program um, offers municipalities, as many of you know, 14 high impact actions, um, which if adopted, which, which if um, uh, completed by municipalities, garners points toward grants. Um, New York Stretch is one of those 14 high impact actions. Um, municipalities that adopt New York Stretch will earn 1,200 points toward a points based grant. Um, points based grants are tiered. So by completing actions, you accumulate, you will accumulate points and um, unlock higher and higher uh, grant opportunities. Um, in addition, by adopting New York Stretch, you will receive, uh, depending on the size of your municipality, either a $5,000 or a $50,000 action grant. Those are available on a first come, first serve basis as long as they're available. This slide shows as of the first, uh, the number of grants that are remaining. Um, need adoption of New York Stretch for um, uh, as, as a high impact action 
um, expires June 30th of 2022. So you have until June 30th of this year um, to adopt New York Stretch and for it to take effect in order to receive credit um, for the Clean Energy Communities Program. So something to keep in mind. So to date, 31 municipalities have adopted New York Stretch. That includes uh, the city of New York, which was the first adopter way back in 2019. Um, these municipalities have really shown a great commitment and leadership in, in going above and beyond and in, in taking steps to reduce energy use in buildings and reduce the related greenhouse gas emissions uh, that buildings are responsible for. Um, outside of New York City, the Hudson Valley and Westchester County in particular um, has really led the charge in adoption. Um, communities like Bedford, Beacon, Hastings on Hudson, and Dobbs Ferry were among the earliest adopters of New York Stretch. And um, everyone shown here, all the municipalities represented here, um, really deserve uh, a great round of applause. To help support municipalities that adopt New York Stretch or to help inform municipalities and stakeholders that are considering adopting New York Stretch, NYSERDA has um, available uh, four training courses, uh, two on the commercial provisions of New York Stretch, two on the residential provisions of New York Stretch. They are free to code enforcement officials. They are generally offered as webinars. Each, each webinar is 90 minutes. Um, they do carry CEUs, so they carry um, in-service credit for code officials. They also carry um, AIA learning units. Um, they're available typically, uh, there are typically multiple sessions available each month. Um, if you visit our website, and the link is provided on this slide, uh, I, I will, will share the slide after the fact, but if you visit our website, um, there is a directory there uh, from which you can you know, ultimately register for one of these one of these webinars and see what other courses we have available. Um, additionally, NYSERDA has four checklists to support both commercial and residential um, permitting, enforce, per, permitting and inspection enforcement. Um, those checklists are also available on our website um, and uh, they include uh, an option for uh, projects that are permitted under New York Stretch 2020. Um, also on our website are some additional tools and resources, including an adoption guide, uh, which was recently updated, and, and that includes um, a model local law, which also was recently revised. Um, and that adoption guide goes through all the steps necessary for municipalities that do adopt, including filing requirements with the um, State Building Code Council. Uh, we also have uh, residential and commercial cost effectiveness uh, reports and a convenient comparison document that offers uh, a concise summary of the ways New York Stretch amends and adds to the state energy code. Um, and finally, NYSERDA, is, NYSERDA offers um, a group of what we call circuit riders, but basically they are a team of technical experts and code experts and resources that are available to municipalities throughout the state um, to offer technical support, deliver presentations, uh, take part in open Q and A's uh, with local stakeholders, basically whatever is needed to provide support to local governments and stakeholders like builders, architects, those working within communities. Um, the uh, these circuit riders can be contacted at any time. Many of you have already had conversations with your circuit riders, um, but I really encourage anybody who has questions about New York Stretch, whether they are, you know, technical questions related to what New York Stretch requires, or from a process standpoint, um, you know, interpreting requirements for filing a local law, whatever it may be feel free to reach out to one of us. And again, we'll share this slide deck with uh, all of our contacts and links after the fact. And from there, I will turn this back over to Rachel. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for that presentation. It's the perfect lead in to our featured panel, Municipal Perspectives of Adopting New York Stretch 2020. Our moderator is Jen Metzger, PhD, former state senator and New, York, New Yorkers for Clean Power Senior Policy Advisor. Um, there she provides guidance on state policies and prior to her current position, she was a New York State Senator who served from 2019 to 2020. In the State Senate, Senator Metzger was a leading voice for action to tackle climate change, move away from reliance on fossil fuels and increase job creating clean energy investment and practices, including the Freedom of Fossil Fuels Act. Jen served in local government in Rosendale for more than 10 years before she was elected to the Senate. Noam Bramson, the mayor, the city of New Rochelle, he served as the mayor since 2000, January 2006 and has been reelected four times. Prior to becoming mayor, Bramson served for 10 years on the New Rochelle City Council after receiving his master's in public policy at Harvard University. He has been a strong advocate for thoughtful community planning, including the creation of New Rochelle's award-winning sustainability plan. Bramson has served in leadership roles in numerous civic organizations and is a member of the founding board of directors of Sustainable Westchester. Paul Vaca has dedicated most of his career to work in building development in the city of New Rochelle. He currently serves as the commissioner of buildings for the city and works to enforce building codes, ordinances, and other applicable sections of the city code and New York State family of building codes. Prior to stepping into the position, Baca worked as a plans examiner as well as a senior building construction inspector, continuously playing an important role in the construction process. Ellen Calves became the Bedford Town Supervisor in January 2022, but has been involved in clean energy solutions in the town for many years. As a town board member for the last two years and as a staff member at Bedford 2030 for six years, helping Bedford achieve a 44% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and recently helping Bedford reach the number one clean energy communities contest. Prior to her service in the Bedford community, Ellen worked for a fund that invests in climate solutions and practiced as an environmental attorney. Mark Tielking owns Logical Efficiency based in Katona, New York, which provides consultation and implementation services that assess public and private entities in scaling clean energy improvements. Mark also serves as a consultant to the town of Bedford, New York in the role of Director of Energy and Sustainability, where he assists staff and elected leadership in the areas of energy use and resiliency. He serves as a board member of the Bedford 2030 Coalition, where he enthusiastically supports the commitment to move the Bedford community to an 80% reduction of CO2 emissions by 2030. And most recently, Mark served as one of the founders, the board chair and executive director of the EI the Energy Improvement Corporation. Welcome to our featured panel. Thanks, Rachel, uh, for that introduction. And uh, thanks to Sustainable Westchester and NYSERDA for organizing this great event. Um, I'm very excited about our group of panelists today um, who all have different and really valuable perspectives on New York Stretch and its adoption in their communities. Um, when I served in local government, I always really valued uh, the yes, chance I'm here. Yes, working on it. Um, you know, the perspectives yeah. of my colleagues in other communities before, yeah. you know, as I consider new laws and initiatives. So it's great we're, we're, we can present this opportunity today. Um, and we're fortunate because we have uh, contrasting cases on our panel um, with representatives from both a city and a town. We're going to try to cover a few different topics in this limited time we have. Um, first and foremost, you know, why did these communities adopt the stretch code? Um, what has their experience been like and what advice might they have for other municipalities who are considering it. Um, and finally, we're going to hear about an alternative approach taken by the town of Bedford to the stretch code uh, or stretch code implementation um, that municipalities may want to consider. Um, so I'd like to start us off with a question to Mayor Bramson. Um, Mayor New Rochelle adopted the stretch code while it was in the midst of a major um, downtown redevelopment initiative that has involved a lot of new construction, um, which is kind of extraordinary to adopt a, you know, a, a building code in the middle of this. 
our energy code. So could you share with us how um, the New York stretch code kind of fit within the city's sustainability and development goals um, and your main motivations for adopting it? Uh, sure, Thank, thanks very much for the question, Jen. It's an honor to be a part of this panel. Uh, in terms of our motivation for adopting it, it, it certainly is consistent with parallel efforts that New Rochelle has undertaken to reduce our energy consumption and transition to clean energy. Uh, we're part of Westchester Power, which is supported by Sustainable Westchester and is uh, delivering uh, renewable energy through renewable energy certificates. Uh, we uh, amended our downtown overlay zone to require lead silver equivalency for, for new construction and a variety of other steps, including a, a local electric shuttle and, and transitioning to LED lights. So we had a sort of natural inclination to move forward uh, with New York stretch. And yet for the reason that you cited, we did have some initial hesitancy because um, transit oriented development had been such a central focus of our policymaking. And by the way, I think is probably among the most impactful things that a locality can do to promote cl climate goals because we want land use patterns that are less car dependent and where heating and cooling uh, costs and, uh, and energy consumption is lower. So we wanted to satisfy ourselves that adoption of New York stretch would not impede our economic development objectives. Um, this involved lots of conversation between our building commissioner who was on this uh, panel uh, and uh, local developers, as well as a conversation with NYSERDA that was very patient with us in providing information. And we were ultimately uh, convinced that the uh, initial costs associated with compliance with New York stretch were, were absolutely bearable, uh, would receive a payback in the form of, of lower operational and maintenance costs uh, over time. And beyond that could in fact enhance the marketability uh, of Nourishell by demonstrating our commitment to environmental and social governance and, and therefore make us more attractive to mission-oriented investors. And sure enough, that is how it's played out since adoption of New York Stretch. Uh, we've not seen any obstacles at all uh, to our continuing efforts to attract investment to the downtown area. It's been full speed ahead. And uh, we're proud to sort of advertise our commitment to New York Stretch as a selling point uh, for New Rochelle, both to developers and to prospective residents and businesses. Thanks so much, Mayor. And I actually, on um, that, point about it, you know, really um, being an attraction to have a, a green, efficient building um, infrastructure. Um, I just wanted to note that when I was interviewing your master developer, RxR, uh, which is a big um, um, real estate owner, operator, builder, um, they noted that more and more of their investors are looking um, to make sure that um, you know they're investing in you know higher um, energy standards and the like, so that's um, that's good news for the climate <laughs> for sure. Yeah, and, yeah, and I think we should recognize this is where the market wants to go, and so um, whether you're a, a community, a government, or or whether you're you're a builder, if you can anticipate those trends and get ahead of them, you're going to do quite well. If you fail to anticipate those trends, you're going to be left behind. Um, and given that there's a certain inevitability to a broader adoption of New York stretch as it becomes the standard code, uh, being able to move forward with it now and develop that kind of experience, uh, I think will benefit everyone who has taken a step like New Rochelle has and like other communities on this call have. Great. Thank you, Mayor, for sharing those insights. Um, I want to turn to Supervisor Calves now because Bedford is a very different case. Um, you're not undertaking any major commercial development like the city, um, though there may be some new, new residential construction. And you know, I also understand from your building inspector that um, that department is very busy with um, you know, renovation projects. Um, I recall uh, him saying that he gets probably about 850 you know, building permit applications a year. And, about 170 of them on average um, require compliance with the energy code. So I'd like to just ask you, you know, how does um, supervisor, how does the adoption of the stretch code fit into Bedford's overall climate and development goals? You may be on mute too, so just check. Thank you, thank you, Jen. Um, thanks for including me in this panel, Bedford. Um, 
we do a greenhouse gas emissions inventory every few years and really have measurable standards by which we want to continue to achieve greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And our current climate action plan, which was adopted in 2020, sets a goal to reduce emissions by 80% by 2030. So we need to be doing everything as aggressively as we possibly can. And as has been already said um, on, this, on this webinar already, that uh, clearly energy consumed to heat and cool our buildings is the number one contributor uh, in Bedford to increase pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. So we absolutely have to make sure we're doing everything we can. And buildings last for generations. So if we can increase the percentage of high performing, resilient buildings, uh, these will serve our community for for a lifetime, for many years to come. Um, it's the right time to make the change when you're doing a substantial renovation or a new building that you have to build to higher standards. And Bedford already had a custom code since 2012 and people were used to having to do things differently in Bedford. We actually started to review this before we knew the stretch code was out and we, there may be an opportunity to talk more about this, but we were already looking to increase our requirements of our energy code and also ensure that we maintained some of the features that we had in the old code, um, which we were able to do once we decided we should just go with the stretch code, mostly because it was already there and um, we could get points in the clean energy communities contest, which I have to qualify. We reached number one for like a minute and then Hastings overtook us again. <laughs> we, tied, we tied with them and then they overtook us. So in my intro, they said we were number one, but that was, um, it was a tie and then they sped past us again. So we'll catch up. Well, healthy competition in a good way <laughs> from among municipalities. And it's a really good point that you make that just the longevity of our buildings. It's not like switching to a car, uh, a new EV, you know, cars last 10 or 11 years. Our buildings can be around, my house is 140 years old. So it's so important to get, get on, um, you know, address the new construction. Um, I just wanted to, I want to quickly get some um, input from Paul Vaca because I know he has to leave soon, but I just want to ask, um, you know, what was the response of people in your community to adopting the code? I guess they've already been kind of broken in since <laughs> you had a green code, your own custom code, but um, what, you know, what's, have you gotten feedback from the community at all? Thank you oh. for having me uh, on the panel. And um we haven't really received, we got a little bit of negative feedback from some of the design professionals, um, maybe one or two, but overall uh, it's pretty, pretty, pretty seamless process. Um, we have to do review for energy co code compliance anyway. So you know, switching over to the stretch wasn't that difficult. Uh, there are a few additional requirements. Um, but all in all, uh, like like uh, the, the previous presenter stated, there is a little more expense you have to go through up front to comply. But if you're going to hold on to your building, your operational costs will be reduced month to month. Um, this is important. Uh, and and it, it, it's an important thing for the community and um, the Hudson Valley region. Uh, the less energy we use, the less demand we have on the grid. And um, I, I, I think it's a positive thing. I think it would be beneficial if we could, um, if there was some advertisement through maybe local AIA chapters to get additional training uh, for some of the design professionals. And um, that would alleviate some of the tensions that may exist. Thanks, Paul. And yeah, I think it'll really help to have now that NYSERDA has these checklists. Um, I think they're helpful, not just for building departments, but also for the design professionals um, as well, uh, contractors and design professionals. Um, so, so you didn't really, um, for your department, it, it, it wasn't, I, I, I've heard concerns from other communities that have been considering or uh, the stretch code they, about you know about any increase in workload on their on their department. So it sounds to you, it sounds to me like you're saying it's not too bad. I know that your staff took the training 
um, that NYSERDA offers and, and would love if you could just um, talk about that and you know whether it was help whether it was helpful. So well. look, um I guess it's like any anything else, right? No, nobody likes change. Um sometimes you have to make positive change. Uh, our, our staff did take the training. Um we do energy code reviews now. So um there are you know there are a few additional requirements that we have to adhere to. Um that the designers have to adhere to. It is a little bit more expensive on the commercial and the residential side, uh, but it's it's marketable for the people that are, if you're flipping a house and you're selling it to somebody, you, you wanna present the house in a way that yes, your energy costs are gonna be less per month because we built it to a higher standard. Um, the training was good for our folks. You can always have more training um in one of the earlier slides there were some uh, the slides that i actually took pictures of because i'm going to call nicerta and find out about additional information to help us you know complete our mission here great well thanks so much paul and i know your your time is very limited this morning but it's so important to hear um it's one thing to you know pass the pass a new law on a code but then you know to, you're the one who's implementing it so your perspective is is really important um and i actually um on that question of implementation i'd like to um put a question to mark um mark hilkang who i know has been working on uh the green code and then the stretch code in bedford um Bedford, Bedford uh, pursued an interesting approach. It's an optional approach under stretch that many towns may not be aware of. Um, and it speaks to the question of building department implementation. Um, it's Bedford took what's called a performance-based approach, um, which is, which as I said, is an option under stretch. And Mark, if you could just talk a bit about about what a performance-based approach is, how how it differs from, you know, I guess you'd call the standard approach <laughs> that's taken under the stretch code, the prescriptive approach, um, and uh, and why you think it's valuable. Yeah, thanks for the question, and uh, thanks for having me on the the panel. Um, uh, just just to step back a little bit, as Ellen mentioned, we had a, um, a, a an approach in Bedford for the last 10 years to have a performance approach to residential construction. And the purpose of that really go back again to our goals and that we want to create a building stock that serves our community for for generations. And um, and so then fast forward to the stretch code, there are actually many uh, pathways that a building can comply with the stretch code and with the energy code, one of which is a whole building or performance approach, where you essentially put in the, put in the uh, most important components of designing a building into a model, and the model uh, creates essentially a rating. Uh, many people understand a rating as something like the home energy score or home energy rating score, or HERS rating. Um, in this case, uh, and I sort of decided to be agnostic and call it an energy rating index. Um, but the main point is that the building is modeled from the get go to be a high performance building. And in order to comply with the energy with the stretch code, you need to reach a certain rating, a number rating, and that model actually spits out um, that number. So if you um, essentially if you look at you know the entire components of a building, it will uh, generate a, a rating code and that then qualifies the building under the New York stretch code. Um, what it allows for is a lot of flexibility. So if someone wants to uh, put in super efficient windows, you can then maybe compromise a little bit on something like maybe the insulation for uh, or the way you build your foundation. Um, it allows again for trading, allows for a little bit more emphasis on certain areas and de-emphasis in other areas, a lot of flexibility. The main point though, and this goes back to 2012 when we adopted that approach, um, is that it saves a lot of time in the building department because the building department is reliant on a third party rater to essentially generate that rating. So all things being equal, it was a win for Bedford uh, from a lot of reasons. Great, and um, how? what was your building inspector's um, feelings about the adoption of the stretch? I mean, and has, you know, has 
How has it been going? And would you um, recommend it to other communities, this approach, I guess, is also a question. I, I think um, I think the energy rating index approach, as it applies to new construction and the residential only, it makes a lot of sense. Because again, you're, um, you're relying on a, um, a more flexible approach. It's, it allows for uh, professionals in the energy rating industry, the her, especially resident uh, HERS raters, to um, train up the building professionals that are building that building. It creates a, um, an awareness in the community of the importance of building a building that is high performance. Um, the prescriptive approach, which is another pathway, is very piecemeal and frankly a lot more complicated if you're building trying to build towards a stretch code so i highly recommend the approach the building um, inspection team in bedford uh, actually wouldn't have adopted stretch without going the era path because mm -hmm. it's something that they rely on specifically now stepping back to renovations which is a large like the major vast majority of our building applications from the standpoint that need a a energy code um rating um we have to go the prescriptive approach for renovations because it's impossible to build generally impossible to build a, a renovated building to a code uh to an index pathway so there is some compromise there but um overall it's it's the approach that our building department endorsed and um is happy with right i'm glad i'm glad you mentioned that point that um this is this performance-based approach um you're taking applying only to new construction and not to renovation, um, which makes sense. Um, so, um, well, that's great, Mark. Um, I think it is an approach. I know I've mentioned it to other communities and they hadn't heard about it. So <laughs> I'm really glad, um, you know, we got to talk about it. Um, Bedford also had these additional innovations. I just wanted to you to touch on if you could. Um, the uh, affidavits that that you all um, put together to just again make it even easier for your building department. And this doesn't even you know it could be stretch code, it could be any energy code. I mean, it's not it's not specific to stretch per se, but it was I thought an interesting innovation. Yeah. So so our building department requires that the the professionals working on the building to sign an affidavit. Um, and on that affidavit, it certainly qualifies their competence around and, and skills and, and certifications related to be a, um, a participant in the process. Um, but it also flags certain areas that we wanted to make sure that the code um, is uh, highlighted. So in particular, ventilation. Uh, ventilation in a high performance building is super important. Uh, you don't want to have a building that's too tight without the standard um, uh, required ventilation methods, as well as things like duct leakage. You know, if you have leaking ducts, it can be a, a, a energy uh, waster. So these things are highlighted in the affidavits. Um, it's really meant to inform and educate the professionals that are building the building. Um, obviously, if they're building a brand new residential building, a HERS Raider is going to know all this very specifically. But in a renovation where you're maybe changing your heating system, we still, you know, the code still requires that the ducts be built to code. So these components are flagged. It's, it's a time saver from the building professionals uh, that are working on it because they now have to dig in and understand what the duct leakage test is. Even though it's in the code and it's required, they now are it's flagging that for them to um, to dig in and make sure that it's compliant, saving time. Um, that that's really the it's more of a practical thing than it is anything more than that. It also stems back to our original custom code where we were flagging these things as important components that were not part of the code, but now that the stretch code includes them, all it is is really just hopefully saving time for everybody. Great, great. And I also just want to, you know, reiterate the value too of these new checklists that NYSERDA has developed on their website that make it really easy to see what is required, um, both by the building professionals and the department. So we're about out of time. Um, I just wanted to see, um, open it up and see if anyone had uh, on our panel had any advice for municipalities considering adopting the stretch code. Um, I might pick on the mayor if he's still here. <laughs> available. Yeah, I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So, um, yeah, look, I think we should remember that even for folks who are not necessarily environmentally minded, there are ways to demonstrate that the stretch code is in everybody's interest. Um, as many speakers have already indicated, if you look at the costs and benefits accurately and comprehensively, uh, there are very significant medium and, and long term savings that go along with it. Well, well, I think that was a good point, Mayor, about just just the cost value. And I mean, it is, you know, especially, you know, for residents, for households. Yeah. Um, you and, and, you know, as, as Paul pointed out, I mean, it enhances the, the remarketability of your property. I mean, you may not be someone who likes to walk, but you can still recognize that a walkability score is important to your property value. You may not care about landscaping, but you still realize that curb appeal is important. This is the same kind of thing. And increasingly, and, and there's to some degree a generational uh, change in perspectives. Uh, the energy efficiency of your property is going to be among the key things that any potential purchaser looks at. So there's a material interest as well as an environmental interest in doing this properly. That's right. All right. Thank you so much. Well, I want to thank our panel. Um, I really appreciated the time to talk with you all again and um, have the opportunity to share your insights with with. Um, this great audience we have from across the state. And I will turn it back over to Rachel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Next up, we have the benefits of adopting New York Stretch Guidance and Toolkit. Josh Stack, New York Stretch, Cir New York Stretch Circuit Rider, Builder and Resiliency Services. He works as a construction manager and resilience consultant for a diversity of buildings and projects. Josh is a subject matter ex expert to the U.S. Global Change Resilience Dialogues Program, a NYSERDA building and energy code consultant integrating resilience and healthy building strategies into the New York State Uniform Energy and New York Stretch 2020 codes. Josh serves as co-chair of the International Well Building Institute Well Homes Global Advisory is, and is a member of the Well Building COVID-19 Task Force. Welcome, Josh. Great, thank you, everybody. Um, it's been really fantastic to hear the comments to date because that matches um, our experience in the field as a builder of single family homes. So I'll go ahead and share my screen and just give a, a, a few slides from a code writer perspective and also a builder perspective on what New York stretch means in the field and how it does increase health and um, performance. So let me see if I can do that, Rachel. Can everyone see my screen? So really um, benefits to municipalities um, really articulated already. So I'll move through these very quickly. But um, one of the real benefits to municipalities is the idea of uh, local autonomy and flexibility in administering the code enforcement program. The ability to issue interpretations and variances, for example, is really key um, for New York Street stretch provisions. Um, one of the non-energy benefits that I'm really excited about is the idea of how New York Stretch contributes to healthier and higher quality buildings, um, more durable, even providing a basis for resiliency and other non-energy benefits. And I'll show a few examples of those from projects. And then really the idea that New York Stretch does prepare communities for the future with the intensifying climate change. Um, and then also the um, really significant shift to full electrification and higher efficiency, lower carbon construction codes. Um, New York Stretch is a critical path, uh, step on that path to achieving those goals. So the next thing I will do, there we go. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so this is actually a photo from one of our projects. And that kitchen exhaust is one of the key sources in any home, particularly tighter homes, I think as Mark had mentioned earlier, of human health and performance. The emissions from that gas, gas range top are significant, um, typically worse than outdoor air pollution would be observed, um, really significant impact on health. And if that's not properly installed, um, you really don't know how it might impact human health and performance. So testing the exhaust ventilation and ventilation in a home is really essential. And that's one thing that New York Stretch does. So really the benefits New York Stretch focus and break out from a builder's perspective in terms of the enhanced thermal envelope, which is not only a comfort issue, but a thermal health issue, uh, enhanced ventilation, which again goes to comfort, but also uh, a very robust scientific basis of human health and indoor environmental quality and, and human performance and cognitive function in buildings. Um, and 
really New York stretch achieves those two goals through a visual, visual inspection process, very similar to what's already existing in the 2020 energy code. And then also performance testing of systems as installed. So you can verify those systems are installed as designed. And as a builder, for example, I can assure our clients then that those built those systems are performing how they had anticipated and paid for the designer and me as the builder to install. So one of the areas New York Stretch focuses on in the residential side is it really clarifies the mandatory inspection process that's already in the uniform and the energy code. And, and what it does, it refers to a specific table in the energy code where you go through and look at the consistency and installation of the installation as installed. And this is a photo actually from one of our projects where if we hadn't moved that insulated duct on the edge of a wall on the other side of that wall is the exterior, uh, the insulator had missed that section. So that is the exterior plywood sheathing that you're looking at with no insulation at all. If we had just gone ahead and sheetrocked or if um, you know, the, the inspector hadn't moved that, that insulated duct, that would have been a point of failure. So any sort of condensation, vapor, or bulk water movement through that wall would have condensed at that point, would have created mold. It would have been a cold spot in the room that our client would have otherwise noticed and, and, and pointed out to us. And without that infield visual inspection and how New York Stretch clarifies it, these are the sort of issues that could go missed. And so that, in addition to the energy loss through that, that area, would also be a really significant human health concern going forward. Uh, similar to this, um, this was a multifamily uh, LMI project that we were the HERS Raider and Energy Star uh, verifier on. And when we went in to do the duct tightness testing, we realized very quickly that the sheet rockers had missed one of the supply ducts. So you see on the right of the screen, that's actually the sheet rocker coming back to cut out the supply. Because when we did the duct tightness testing for that unit, it immediately failed. And when you performance tested as installed, then you can identify whether it actually was installed properly and as intended and, you know, therefore reduce energy consumption, but then also these broader non-energy benefits such as health. So it came back, uh, you know, cut the supply register out, we taped it, tested it, and it passed. So those are the sort of issues in the field that New York Stretch can help create and lead to a better performing building after you construct it and turn it over. Um, this is a project that we verified the performance of in New Hartford, New York. It's a, a three building LMI uh, project. Each of those buildings had, I believe, um, 35 dwelling units in it. And after construction had started, we brought New York Stretch to the project team and just said, hey, let's try New York Stretch on this project and get some market feedback on how it might impact cost. And really, um, the team took it, ran with it, and redesigned the domestic hot water system for the building. And they came back with a $500 to $1,000 per dwelling unit. So 35 units, each of those units would have saved $500 to $1,000 in just the first cost for installing the domestic hot water system following the New York stretch domestic hot water um, requirements. So that was an immediate first cost saving to the project team on this project, really well documented. So I can share those studies from the project team if anyone is interested. Um, even more broadly, others have referred to it. Um, it's really exciting to hear municipalities think about the non-energy benefits of energy codes, including resilience. And so this is a really fantastic study that we're happy to share if anyone is interested in the benefits of adopting the most recent model code. So this is based on the 2018 International Energy Conservation Code. And if you look at the intensifying climate um, hazards and, and disturbances that will be impacting New York over the coming decades, and these buildings we're constructing today will be subject to these increasing vulnerabilities and hazards. So for every dollar invested that might be a first cost under whatever the model code is, or if a municipality were to adopt New York Stretch, that's the return on investment um, for that. And because New York Stretch does include several um, energy efficiency um, provisions, but also non-energy related provisions relating to health and resilience and performance, um, New York Stretch really follows this, this research pretty critically in returning this sort of value to communities in the future. And I think to um, Mark's point, this is a photo from one of our projects, uh, a, a lead project, but what we did here was think creatively. And so I'm really encouraged to hear the municipality talk about the performance path. Uh, New York Stretch does 
as an overlay, follow the energy code compliance path, so it's prescriptive path, performance path, ERI path. It also introduces a passive house path, but under the performance path as a builder, you are um, encouraged to make trade-offs and optimize your first um, financial investment in constructing the home. And so here, what we did essentially to provide the client with a free energy recovery ventilator at no additional first cost, um, a healthier ventilation system for the home using a balanced system with heat recovery, we looked at it and removed that many studs from a wall assembly using code approved advanced framing techniques. So that's 86 two by six by 10 foot studs. That's Brian, one of our carpenters, just to give a sense of scale. So that's all the wood we didn't need to put into the wall. And when we calculate the amount that costs in today's terms, it's about $2,000 to $2,500 in this pandemic market. And if you save that $2,000 to $2,500, you can easily go back and purchase something like an ERV or an HRV at no additional first cost. And that's really the creativity that we hope a lot of builders and designers will see with programs like New York Stretch. And that if you go beyond just a prescriptive path, project teams and builders can find a very creative and flexible approach to achieving even above code energy requirements, such as New York Stretch. And even if you go beyond New York Stretch, for example, here, the savings of removing that wood from the wall, if you translated it to the number of housing starts that year, it was equivalent to about 30,000 acres of forest each year if every builder just did this that didn't have to be harvested. So if you think of the, the, the benefits of New York Stretch amplified to a state level, they are um, incredibly meaningful and significant. So I would just close with this um, really quickly. Um, there is an adoption guide with a model resolution. Um, the process has clarified over the last year and a half. So the Code Rider team is here to help. We're a free resource to any municipality for introductory presentations, but also to go through the process now that we've um, done that with, I believe, more than 31 communities that have adopted New York Stretch. So there's a defined path and an optimal way to, to consider New York Stretch for any community, and then also um, to go through that adoption and implementation process. So with that, I would just say um, thank you and uh, turn it back over. The next uh, part of our presentation, the last part of our presentation before the question and answer session is a municipal discussion, new adopters and code official. Um, we, uh, so I'm Rachel Carpatella and in my role with Sustainable Westchester, I direct the commercial clean heating and cooling campaign notably securing funding and technical assistance for property owners to decarbonize their buildings in 30 municipalities. I previously led the Green Business Partnership Business Development, served as sustainability leader with the Greenberg Nature Center, where I launched a food scrap recycling program for the town of Greenberg and its villages. Previous to that, I directed NYPIRG's Clean Energy uh, Community Outreach Campaigns in the Hudson Valley and Long Island. I advise the Jones Beach Energy and Nature Center and board chair of Green Inside and Out, a founding member of the Long Island Organics Council and sit on the Town of Babylon Climate Smart Task Force. Today, I am so pleased to have this discussion with Supervisor Warren Lucas of the Town of North Salem. He has over 31 years of experience as an elected town board official, including 12 years of experience as town supervisor, and prior to this role, he served as deputy supervisor and town councilman from 1990 to 2009. He was an active part of the Wamoa Westchester Municipal Officials Association Legislative Committee as a member and former chair and spent time in Albany discussing Westchester's legislative agenda with state legislators and specifically the Westchester delegation. On top of that, Mr. Lucas is an executive board member at Sustainable Westchester. Supervisor Levenberg has led Ossetting since January 2016 and is now a candidate for New York State Assembly. Under her leadership, Ossetting has installed electric vehicle charging stations, launched a food scraps recycling partnership uh, in partnership with T-Town Nature Center, installed local, instated local laws permitting solar installations and battery energy storage, and developed a new comprehensive plan, which is now uh, in the works. Dana introduced the Energy Smart Homes Program, the Grid Rewards Program, and the Habitat Stewards Program, to name a few, as well as being a member on Sustainable Westchester's Board of Directors, 
Dana Levenberg served for nine years on the Austin School Board and was Chief of Staff for Assemblywoman Sandy Gala. Um, Charles V. Minozzi Jr. is the building inspector and head of the building department for the village of Hastings on Hudson. He is certified code enforcement officer with 38 years experience in the construction industry. He has vast training in energy efficient building standards. He is proud to be part of one of the leading municipalities in energy efficient construction that has made strides in reducing our carbon footprint by requiring high efficient heating and cooling systems, energy star appliances, and low embodied concrete. Um, unfortunately, Charles had a another um, had something come up the last minute, so he was not able to participate in the discussion today. But he pre-recorded a video for us, and. Um, he wanted to share what some of the keys to successful adoption and implementation of New York stretch code are. So I will play the short video before we jump into our discussion with the supervisors. I think one of the most important things is to bring your building department manager or building inspector on board as soon as possible. Um, because they're the ones that are ultimately going to be enforcing this code. And not only do they have to be um, familiar with the code, they have to be trained on it. And it's very important that they understand what it's all about. And then having their backing going to going for your board it, is very important. Um, so when we first adopted it, I had an I really didn't know how to enforce the code because I wasn't 100% sure. The reading's a little bit out of the ordinary. So um, I wasn't sure on, on what or how I was really going to handle how we were gonna regulate this code. So I was offered training. And once I got the training, it was a piece of cake. It, it, it made me understand exactly what I was looking for. It explained the code itself. Are you getting a lot of pushback from design professionals or from builders? I did in the beginning. Once they on the ones that were questioning it, once they understood it, nobody. Unless I have a new contractor, nobody questions it anymore. It's really not difficult to reach. Um, going by the fenestration and insulation charts that are provided um, in section three of the code. Um, it's, it's a slight upgrade. It's not that much more money to, to comply with the code. And it's, it's gonna pay back relatively quickly because of the, the small increase that they're really looking for. I said it before to my fellow code officials, my local neighboring code officials is don't be afraid. Get the training. Once you have the training, it all makes sense. And, and it's maybe a lot to swallow the first time you read it. Take your time, go through the sections, see where they apply. Not everything applies to every, every project. See what applies where and get your training. Once I got my nice sort of training, I cannot tell you, it was like somebody flipped the switch on. And I went from being like foggy to clear in one class. And, and that's that, that what I would say is the key it is don't be afraid. So right from Charles Minozzi, we hear, don't be afraid. And um, I now we will head into our discussion with Supervisor Lucas and uh, Supervisor Levenberg. Um, the question that I think we could start a discussion with is, do you have advice for how adoption of New York stretch by other municipalities might be accelerated? Who do you want to talk first? I welcome you to share your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, so um, Dana, you go ahead. No, I just said you go ahead. Okay, go we're ahead. like each other. 
you know, one of the things that we had that was very beneficial is we had Bedford in the area. It was another town that actually had moved forward on some of this. And one of the things that was the biggest concern to me was the education of the building inspector, what other people would perceive, uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the regulations. And so we spent some time talking to, the, you know, Bedford and uh, our building inspector, while the first comment from him was, this is a lot more work, I'm not interested. What happened over a very short period of time with the education uh, was he, he was completely on board. And one of the things that we also found out was that it's not critical uh, that he understand all of the energy aspects of it because that's all reviewed by a third party in our case. I have a very small uh, town, there's 5,200 people. I don't have huge amounts of, of folks. And so it was important that it was something that was manageable for us. And so if there's people around you that, that um, or anybody in the state, I would reach out to some of the other municipalities and get an idea of people that are ahead of you on this, get an idea of all the things that they ran into and, uh, you know, work with their knowledge and try to make it a little bit better. I don't, Dana. First of all, I have to say a thank you to uh, the first panel because um, I think they pretty much answered all the questions. So we really don't have to do anything more, right? I don't know about you, but that's how I feel. Um, but, and I was especially um, impressed by Mark Teal King, who I know well from, um, from Energize and Pace um, at all of the work that Bedford has done and that performance-based um, um, path that they took. And I think that that's something for us to all look into a little bit more. I'm not saying that we, that we, we did it, but you know, we know Bedford's always out front. So is Hastings, but number one for us was, you know, I don't know about, but anybody other leadership, but I know that, you know, if you don't have your staff on board, you're nowhere, right. you get pushed back. It's going to be difficult to get anywhere with this, you need to get your building department and your code enforcement officials on board immediately. That is the number one step before you try to, um, to adopt anything, because when they have an understanding of what is involved, like you heard from Charles, then, then you are going to feel much more confident, much more comfortable going to your boards and talking about what the benefits are. And, you know, I think Warren's talked a lot about um, it's not just about energy efficiency. And we also heard from Noam that, you know, it's it's not just about doing right by the environment. It's also doing right by your uh, by your um, values of your, your property values and um, health conditions in your buildings. And, you know, so much more, so many things that are maybe the, the good potentially unintended consequences. And um, again, our building inspector found that it was really, um, easy to sell it because of the savings that were realized in a short amount of time for builders that it wasn't going to be such a hard sell um, for whatever the difficulties might have seemed like they were up front um, that those were easily mitigated and easily discussed and um, and that I think was for us again having our, our code enforcement officer our building inspector on board right at the start right at the get-go was what made it very easy for us. Thank you so much, Supervisor Levenberg. Um, I, sometimes energy efficiency can be put into a box of a, a green program, which sometimes is aligned with a, a democratic platform. But we do have Supervisor Lucas today on the line who has been, uh, yeah, do you want to speak to how this- I was going to say, I wasn't, I wasn't going to bring up the fact that I was a Republican, but uh, I guess that's the implication here. But We're yeah, you know- Anytime, exactly, right? Anytime yeah. I'm involved with any of these things, and we've done a lot of work in town with all the lighting, street lighting, everything else to try to um, be more efficient. Uh, there's two approaches, right? You need to bring everybody along. And I think that was the discussion that we, we had a couple of days ago when we were talking about this. And one is just energy efficiency. It's it's a money saving. It, it, there, it's, it's an absolute no brainer. I The other thing I would suggest people do if they have people in their communities, or if they know people that have built houses to a higher spec and energy spec, go talk to them and find out what the costs are. And you'd be surprised, they are gonna be some of your best proponents. Uh, I have a friend of mine that lives uh, right uh, next town over. Uh, there's no energy code there, but he built his, he had his house built to the energy code. Uh, for him, prior to the <laughs> just recent increase in electricity, it was costing him just over $100 a year to heat and cool the place, uh, $100 a month, excuse me, uh, which is, it's pretty substantial. So I always look at these things and say, it's great for the environment, we need to do it. But there are people that you, you need to bring along and you need to talk about the, the fact that 
this is going to save them a significant amount of money. And I think it was mentioned many times over the life of a building. Uh, you know, this isn't something you're you're doing just for the next couple of years. This is this is what you're going to be living in for many people. You know, 30 years plus. And so it's very important that people understand that. When when people, you know, one of the things that ended up happening when people um, heard that we were doing this because it was in the newspapers on our Facebook, we had meetings and such was, you know, you're, you're increasing the cost to the homeowner, the bill, the person that has to pay for this. And when you look at it, um, I think Chris may have mentioned it originally, it's one to 2% is what we see about, about 2%. And that varies based on the cost of your housing in your area, but the savings are significant. And uh, that's something that I think you always need to bring forth in these discussions. We're not just decarbonizing for the sake of decarbonizing, we're saving money, which in fact is also decarbonizing. So it's 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 a good all around. You need to mention that to people and you need to bring them along with you. We had no problems once we did that with anybody in town uh, with regard to the building code. Everybody was very, very supportive. And your property value goes up as well, not to mention yeah. that we hear also from people who have made these um, improvements that their ho homes are more comfortable. Right. I mean, that's another advantage. And, and you have more control. Um, Warren, you're always controlling the heating and cooling of your houses here, hither and yon. So, um, you know, being able to do that and, you know, if you if you if you happen to also be able to put solar panels up or, or tap into, you know, community solar or something like that, like, you know, that's those are big savings. Of course, you know, if you've also um, have a community that's joined the um, community choice aggregation, not that that's a plug or anything, but, you know, um, a shameless plug, I should say. But if you don't have a community that's already done that, then you're, you know, you're not, you're not um, keeping your, um, your energy costs, um, you know, at, at, at bay right now in a difficult Even time. on top of that, Danny, you need to have an energy efficient home. Yeah, right. that's, yeah, absolutely. You can do all the other things, but if you're, if you don't, you, you have some issues trying to. Right. And I mean, the only thing that I would also add is just that, you know, we, um, when we rolled, when we rolled out the code, you know, that was the new stretch code was included in all of the our building department's documents going out um, for applications and, you know, all, and sharing all that information out up front. Again, you know, everybody likes predictability. So n knowing what you're up against, you know, you want to make sure that you get the information out, um, out to the um, anybody who is considering building um, as, as quickly as possible so that they, um, they're, they'll, they're on board and they build that into their, into their um, upfront costs. But again, you're going to have that back end savings. Um, for the long term, and that's um, much more um, in, important. At certainly looking at the volatility of the of the market right now. And how is it preparing those materials to go out? Did, were those resources provided by NYSERDA? You're talking about going out to the community. Yeah. Yeah, a, a lot of those documents, pamphlets, and things were supplied. We created them. I have a very active um, group here in town. A climate smart community group and CAC that worked on those also. We've had uh, a lot of interactions between the newspaper on our town website, Facebook pages, trying to get the information out to people. But all that stuff's available, and I certainly did a great job at providing that. And, and uh, it was, the names were put up before. I think we called them circuit riders. Uh, uh, Mike DeWine is is the person that uh, we had, and he was really great. He got on face uh, on uh, on Zoom meetings with us at uh, town board meetings and answered everybody's questions. And I'm, I'm sure the, the rest of them, if they're as good as he was, uh, it's, it's a, a nice sort of has a, a great program there to, to help and support communities. And getting well, a few true. bucks back from NYSERDA is also nice because you can put it into other energy uh, savings initiatives. And Ania has been extremely helpful. Uh, I know with all of our communities, um, with getting us where, where we were and where we were able to put some of those incentives back to our community. So I think that's also really important. Even if you don't get the 50,000, those little chunks of $5,000 add up quickly and uh, you mm -hmm. can um, chip away at some of your other projects that you're hoping to implement. And just, just to mention uh, just another plug for the uh, Climate Smart community, the, the group that we have, the moderator, Catherine Daniels, she may be on this call. She's really done a phenomenal job. So it's not just necessarily, she's on the town board but that entire group has just done a phenomenal job at getting the message out and talking to people about it. It's been very, very and helpful. now I'm speaking with your chief of staff about using grant awards from the Climate Smart Communities toward 
installing heat pumps in a municipal property for the town of North Salem. So it's, exactly. that's, it's really great. Um, I think uh, I'll give the opportunity for any last remarks and then we can go into question and answer. I, I think- Just do it. Go ahead, oh, Dana. Just do it. What are you waiting for? <laughs> okay, that's my last remark. <laughs> you need everybody on board. So start working on that. It doesn't take too long. Talk to some neighboring, if it's not neighboring, talk to some towns in New York State, Bedford, Ellen, I'm sure isn't going to have a problem with everybody calling her up, but uh, there are other municipalities around that have done this for a while. Call them up, talk to their building specters. Hasting on Hudson's is uh, Hasting on Hudson is another one, and uh, and and pick their brains, understand what the issues are, um, resolve them in your town, talk to other people, and just just move forward. It's it's really nobody complained. Very very very. I, a few people called me up and uh, we talked about it and they were happy. So I yeah. to move on it. And I'll just add to that, yes, call Nikki Armacost in Hastings um, also because she's always, you know, she's trying to get out in front of all of us and she's succeeding. I'm not saying she's not. So Mayor of Hastings, um, as well as the supervisor of Bedford, because they are, they definitely have been leaders and we're all trying to keep up with them, but um, keep up with them we will and we must because that is what's going to make a difference in our state and actually um, in our, in our on our earth so you know we have to we have to chip away at uh climate change in whatever ways we can we have to take personal responsibility professional responsibility local responsibility and um it's not that hard to do um so this is just another tool kit in the kit i think that is a perfect end note for us thank you so much supervisor levenberg thank you so much supervisor lucas um, your leadership and experience is invaluable. We have been collecting questions from the chat. We welcome you to put your questions into the chat now. It's not too late. Um, we will start with some um, that we've already received. So the first question is with Con Ed set to lift the gas moratorium late next year, is there a movement to keep the mor moratorium in place through adoption of new codes. Yep. Uh, hi, Rachel. Uh, Chris Corcoran here. Uh, yes, I, I think you know it's it's certainly something that's that's being considered. As I mentioned during the the my presentation, uh, we are launching a uh, a pilot called Stretch to Zero um, that's going to help support communities that want to make that change uh, to a all you know an all electric zero on on-site uh, GHG emissions code. Uh, so we'll be we'll be partnering with communities to, to help do that um, over the next few years uh, and uh, you know look forward to using that as a, as a model for other communities that want to take and uh, take those steps in the coming years. Great, thank you. The next question that we have is uh, can you give a summary of the differences between Energy Star building code and New York stretch 2020? Hi, this is Chris Roy. So um, we, we don't, Energy Star for homes is a, kind of a separate thing. We don't have a comparison between the requirements of Energy Star and New York Stretch 2020. We do have a comparison document um, on our website within the, um, we have basically a toolkit to support New York Stretch adoption, enforcement and compliance. That includes a comparison document of New York Stretch 2020 relative to the state energy code. Um, so, you know, if you're interested, like I said, this, our slides will be shared after the fact. I also dropped the link into the chat, um, a, a link to our training directory. And from there, you can access all of the resources that we have available. Um, and obviously, if you have, you know, more specific questions or follow-up questions, you can reach out to me directly or to the circuit rider um, for your region. And does New York State give tax credit for this? So there are no direct incentives or tax credits for building to the New York stretch 2020 standard. Um, NYSERDA does have, uh, NYSERDA has, has, has incentive programs for higher performance construction. Um, New York stretch, like I said, is, a, is an incremental step forward. It is by no means the ceiling. 
So there are incentive programs for higher performance construction, both for new construction and um, existing buildings. And if anybody is, is interested in finding more about those, again, you can contact me or one of my colleagues and we'll put you into contact with the right person or program that supports those. And we have a follow-up question from Nina Eisman. Um, uh, Eisenman, um, are tax exempt, are there incentives available for tax exempt organizations to update their buildings, heating systems to non-fossil fuel alternatives like heat pumps or geothermal? So um, again, there are, I wanna be clear, New York Stretch, I mean, as a starting point, New York Stretch doesn't require using a heat pump. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't require electrification of buildings. Um, obviously, NYSERDA in the state is prioritizing moving toward, uh, uh, you know, a, a more electrified grid. And that involves, um, that will involve use of heat pumps and other non-fossil fuel uh, burning appliances to heat and cool homes and buildings. So again, there's no incentive, there's no direct incentive for New York stretch adoption associated with these things, but we do have programs and utilities do have programs um, that you may be able to leverage for things like, uh, you know, uh, fuel switching or heat pumps. And if you wanna know more, um, again, I can put you into contact with the right person. Um, will New York State be adopting an equivalent code to New York Stretch in 2023? So NYSERDA is, um, we're working on kind of the next iteration of New York Stretch right now that is in development. Um, New York Stretch 2020, uh, the state does not have any plans to adopt New York Stretch 2020. Again, it's a supplement to the state energy code. It overlays the state energy code, the current state energy code. Um, we'll continue to improve on New York Stretch over time, um, but New York State will not be adopting New York Stretch 2020 in 2023. We have some feedback from Alex Covenant. Um, AIA Westchester Hudson Valley Secretary. Um, they said it would be great if New York State would follow Massachusetts and Connecticut and provide to design professionals subsidized training for passive house, which is referenced in the New York stretch code. Do you have a response to that? I would say NYSERDA is, you know, we provide and have for many years, we've provided training, we have provided training. Um, on the energy code and uh, training related to energy code, I guess we'll say energy code adjacent buildings, building performance related training. Um, it's regularly updated. We are regularly looking at ways to expand and tailor training to better meet the needs of design professionals, um, builders and trades, code enforcement officials, um, and uh, you know, keep them up to date on, on ever changing landscape related to cold, uh, code and building higher performance buildings. So um, our program isn't currently sponsoring passive house training. That's not to say that we wouldn't. Um, so again, um, you know, my, information, I've sh my information is shared with you all. Um, if you see opportunities or gaps in you know, needs-based gaps, in training and education, um, please bring them to me and we'll see, you know, we'll look at ways to accommodate. Excellent, thank you, Chris. The next question came from Michelle Rogat. The question is, the third party in the energy index rating is the cost for those energy audits being covered by NYSERDA incentives or the building contractor? So the ERI path, there are there are four I included this in um, the chat, but New York stretch offers four ways to comply, four ways for residential buildings to comply with with New York stretch requirements as again, as it overlays the state energy code. Um, that is a prescriptive path, which includes 
Um, the UA alternative, which is most often um, demonstrated by use of ResCheck. There's a simulated performance alternative, which is a full-blown energy model. There's the ERI path, which is um, calculated using uh, ResNet 301 standard from 2014. And there's also the passive house compliance alternative. Um, so four ways to comply, whereas the state code without the New York stretch supplement offers three, it doesn't offer that passive house alternative. Um, the ERI path is an option for compliance. It's not required. Um, if the building owner chooses, you know, if, if the building owner or developer chooses to demonstrate compliance with New York stretch using an ERI approach, um, that's, you know, that if it's not an energy audit um, and it would be paid for, you know, the, the process for um, you know, demonstrating that level of compliance would be paid for by the building owner or developer or builder um, who's ever responsible for the project. It's not, it's not incentivized by NYSERDA. Yeah, so the, the, the link is in yeah. the chat. Um, I just wanted to make sure that everyone uh, sees that that link was put into the chat from Anil Acharyan. So thank you. Um, yeah. So did I'll, you want to add mention, anything? I mean, that, sure. Yeah, that, that basically answered the question, but I just want to mention um, there are, uh, there, like, like I said, there are four checklists. Um, we also have what we refer to as dynamic versions of those checklists, meaning based on the parameters of the project and the inputs that are on, on the first page of that checklist, um, the, the dynamic version of those checklists will reveal only what sections of the code are relevant to the particulars of the project. So those will ultimately be on our website as well. They aren't yet, but if you're interested in those dynamic versions, you know, reach out to us and we'll circulate. Excellent. Um, are there, oh, sorry, that was answered already. Does this training today have TDU value for oh, P-E-R-A-C-E-O? So there are no, this is, uh, unlike all of the technical training that we provide, um, again, to design professionals, like architects, engineers, code, code officials, other building professionals, trades, um, that may carry, that, you know, that may maintain a certification annually. This training is informative. It's an opportunity to hear from representatives from municipalities that have adopted New York Stretch that are enforcing it and their experiences there. So it doesn't, this, this webinar does not carry um, any continuing education credit, but, um, you know, as mentioned, and I included a link in the chat, we do offer monthly many opportunities for training that do carry uh, CEU. So if you're interested, I do encourage you to um, take a look at what we have available. Um, John Ebert asked, would adoption of the New York stretch code require installing a heat pump system in a single family home when their oil fire or gas fired boiler uh, with a heat no. pump system? So they're asking, yeah, so, yeah. Right, so as mentioned, New York stretch does not it's not an electrification code um, or a decarbonization code, um, and it's it's fuel neutral. Meaning, to answer your specific, you know, this specific question, if your gas if your gas fired or oil fired boiler dies, uh, New York Stretch does not dictate what you replace it with or the fuel that you use. Um, if you're on an oil system, I mean, you know, we would definitely encourage you to look into a heat pump. Um, because we think it would make sense in most cases, but New York Stretch is not requiring it. I would I would just add add to that though. I mean, one thing that, that New York Stretch is what you know and those energy codes generally do is reduce the the loads that are needed for those those fuel equipment, the fuel fired equipment, or for the heat pumps. Um, again, it's that efficiency that's so important um, to reduce the mechanical load, reduce the emissions, uh, reduce the monthly energy bills in the end. According to Con Ed's 2022 investment proposal, we indicate that electricity prices will continue to increase as the grid decarbonizes, which may make New York stretch attractive for ROI. Additionally, we indicate that district steam prices will rise as steam generation decarbonizes. Can the panelists comment on how these rate changes 
can affect the adoption to New York stretch? Thank you, John Enoch, for that question. Absolutely, I, I would just I, I would expand and, and note again. I mean, it, this is New York stretches is, is driving efficiency uh, in buildings. It's going to have you know buildings that are built to New York stretch are going to have a tighter envelope. Um, they're going to have better ventilation, and they're going to have lower energy use across the board. Uh, so whether you know that is future proofing. When we we know that like that that uh, gas prices are going to go up, you know, and as they point out, it looks like Conet you know Conet has noted that electricity prices you know are going to go up. Uh, this an efficient building um, is the best way to future proof you, uh, you uh, and your your business, your family from those those uh, future spikes. Uh, this question for um, Jen Metzger, uh, Chris, can you mention the New York stretch to zero pilot again and the deadline for applying? We are so excited about this opportunity. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so our, again, our, our New York stretch to zero pilot um, is going to be uh, is is currently out and been released as an RFP. Um, it's on our website right now. Uh, there is there is two point six million dollars available for communities who want to adopt um, a zero on site greenhouse gas emissions code, basically to go to an all electric code um, over the next couple of years. We know there's a lot of interest in that. As we've talked about, we know that that buildings are going to need to decarbonize between now and 2050. Having an efficient all electric building is the best way to reach those goals. Um, and so this pilot is going to help lay the groundwork uh, for you know for these these initial communities, uh, but also you know this you know other communities across the state and potentially the state to you know to eventually move in that direction. Uh, the the deadline. Um, let's see, Anila, do you do you have the uh, the deadline for that? The deadline is uh, April 21st, Chris. Perfect. And so, um, just to add, we're going to have a, another webinar uh, to provide additional information on the Stretch to Zero pilot program and to answer any questions you have. I am going to copy and paste the link to that webinar in the chat in just a moment. So um, if you'd like to learn more, please join us on the 8th. And uh, thank you, Liz. Liz, Liz Staubach um, from our team at NYSERDA is, is leading that pilot. Um, so she'll be our, our primary point of contact uh, for, for that. If you have any questions, we're happy to, happy to help. Excellent. We have a question from Gary Rogers. How does the stretch code apply to additions to existing single family homes? As, as mentioned, um, the stretch code Again, you know, I feel like a broken record, but it supplements the state energy code. Um, it doesn't replace the state energy code. And the state energy code is, uh, the state energy code provides for um, the application of code requirements to existing buildings, um, which New York stretch doesn't change. Um, so ultimately, if you are, building in or designing um, in a municipality that has adopted New York stretch, the triggers for when New York stretch requirements apply to existing buildings are no different from a community that hasn't adopted New York stretch. And the rule of thumb is, um, so for a, for a building alteration, if you are any, any building system or equipment that is part of the scope of the project, in, you know, in general, must must comply with whatever the code requirement is, whether it's a New York stretch specific requirement or a state energy code requirement. If you're touching the system, it must be brought up to code. But any building systems or components that are not part of the scope of that project aren't required to be brought up to code. So just as an example, um, if you are, if you're building an addition to your house, um, you're not, you, you don't, that doesn't suddenly mean that you have to add insulation in your um, existing roof or replace all of your windows if that isn't part of the scope of your, of your project. So uh, hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Joseph London with the New Paul uh, Climate Smart Community. He says, what does NYSERDA think the roadmap from New York stretch to stretch to zero looks like? I really think of them, you know, in a sense as, as two kind of, you know, independent, you know, pathways, you know, stretch really drives efficiency. 
again, you know, we want to have the, the most efficient buildings possible. And, you know, we do that, you know, with tight envelopes. Uh, we do that, you know, with fenestration. We do, you know, there's a lot of best practices that go into building a tight envelope, regardless of what the fuel is and regard, you know, regardless of what the systems are inside. Uh, but then in parallel, I think there's, there's this parallel path to, to consider, do we want to have on-site emissions? Uh, do we want to have gas fired equipment in, in you know in buildings um and so thinking about that to say you know how you know how can we get an efficient house um and then uh, and or building and then at the same time do we want those buildings to have uh to have emissions on site um you know so it's it, it's not necessarily a roadmap as much as it is you know these are these are you know options that are in front of us uh to have the most efficient decarbonized buildings uh you know possible and as we work to have the most efficient decarbonized buildings as possible, there are other tools at our disposal. And, and one opportunity that's coming to mind is Pond 4600. Anila, would you like to speak to that opportunity? Thank you so much. Um, thanks to all the participants. So Pond 4600 um, is an exciting, innovative pond that we've just launched. It has $2 million in funding and it has two components, the third party support, process, which you heard many speakers speak to, uh, we are actually qualified and we're very proud to announce that we have the first list of qualified third party support providers, and they can provide uh, assistance to existing AHJ's code departments, uh, because what it is, is that it's a process that the permit applicant can, can go to these qualified third party support providers. It doesn't change anything in terms of the AHJ's uh, responsibilities. And we are giving as much as fifty thousand dollars to. Uh, we have a very exciting uh, funding opportunity that's that's posted in the thing. So I'd encourage people, Westchester Munis that are uh, under a forty k threshold can get as much as fifty thousand and above. You know, we have we have uh, more money, and you know, also for the advancing code compliance piece, we have similar tranches of money. So just to summarize, if you take on the third party component of the uh, pawn, you can get, if you're a municipality under 40K, you can get $50,000 if you uh, share with us your implementation experiences in implementing this component. And if you're larger than 40K, your municipality, then you get $100,000 for that component of the pawn. And if you are interested, which I think many municipalities in Westchester and New York State, it's quite surprising, many of them are paper driven. We in NYSERDA want to encourage the ability for code officials to have like a seamless, transparent, responsive way to engage with uh, community residents. And so here we're providing very generous funding um, with a duly noticed RFP. Uh, you can get, as if you're a municipality of under 40K, uh, you can get $75,000 directly applied to the purchase of an online permitting program of your choice. Um, and if you are a municipality of larger than 40K, the threshold is 150,000. So this is a very generous opportunity, uh, funding opportunity. And it's an exciting opportunity because we want to move uh, AHJs online and uh, increase um, you know, transparency and also reduce work hour burdens of code officials. Thank you for giving me that brief spiel. We're very the, excited the about that. Yeah. Um, a follow-up question about the stretch to zero RFP from Liz Silverstein. Um, to be eligible for the stretch to zero RFP, must you have already adopted stretch or can this be all be done at once? Short answer, no. You don't have to have uh, adopted a New York stretch to go, to move in the stretch to zero. But as we said, it's you know it's certainly helpful. Um, and as you'll see in the RFP, um, there's a lot of things that go into the into the uh, judging, um, including uh, disadvantaged community status. Um, so there, you know that you know, and so things like New York stretch adoption, you know, will be will be considered in this selection, but certainly not required. Okay, great. Um, I think we have a follow up for our municipal leaders that are still on the line. I I can't tell from our panel who are still here. So um, hopefully some of them are. Um, what are some of the key capacity or training needs you need to meet the goals of advancing clean energy codes in your municipality? Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm, I, the education part, I understand. I'm not sure I understand the, the rest of the question, but really for us, it was the building department. We had to get them on board and the classes that they went to, they went to multiple NYSERDA classes last year, and they also took additional courses. 
And once they were on board, it was pretty straightforward. We had no issues with builders. We have no issues with uh, developers. We have two new subdivisions coming in. They're smaller subdivisions, and uh, uh, it has been an issue for them. The real, the hardest part for a small municipality is to make sure the two building inspectors we have, we have a building inspector and an assistant, that they're on board, and that was all handled. As I said originally, they had a problem with that. They had a problem with the new building code. It was extra stuff they had to do and stuff they had to learn. And I think you heard it from uh, uh, Hastings on Hudson, um, uh, building inspector earlier on the video. Uh, once he went to the class, it was just literally, it was, it was a no brainer after that. They came back in and said, this is gonna be easy. Especially when they heard that somebody else reviews the energy aspect of it. Because all they really are responsible for is, is, the, uh, is the building, um, the build itself, the framing and everything else like they normally would. Dana, I don't know if you wonder if well, I'm, I'm, I'm at the Westchester Municipal Officials meeting that's about to start. And so Peter Parsons and Peter Shearer are having a sidebar conversation. I've told them that they, they should have been on this so that they could have gotten this implemented um, in their communities, but they're they're just talking about their lunch. Um, but sorry, sorry, just joking. I just wanted to give them a little a little shout out. Um, and New Rochelle, yes, we 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 have um Chuck Strom here, and, and they're already good to go. And Nikki Armacross, everybody's joining me now. So all I would say is that the, as far as the training is concerned, it is not that difficult. Um, you know, the code enforcement um, is offering it. And our, um, again, our, our building officials are, are getting the training that they need pretty easily. And, and I don't know if that's answering the question or not, but um, if any of any the other municipal officials wanna, wanna, wanna uh, join in there, they can just stand behind me and mention what, what, what their opinion is of that. I'll have to thank Sana. Um, I'll, I'd say we, I feel like we still have a, a lift to do with our um, building professionals. They come in, they don't look at the information. They don't realize we have something different. They get halfway through some of the stuff and then, you know, it's, it's being reviewed and has to be sent back for changes. And that's frustrating, especially when we've had such a backlog in our building department due to all the renovations during COVID. And there's just, a, the quantity has gone up tremendously in terms of what they're reviewing. So this little extra thing when it has to be sent back because they didn't do it right is very frustrating for um, the development uh, professionals. But so we really have tried with the affidavits that we give them right in the beginning that say, you know, kind of everything you're going to have to make sure that you did, hoping that they will read that and see that there's something different that they have to pay attention to. But it's still, it's still a lift. Um, but at the same time, there was a new energy code that came in in 2020 anyway, and there would have been something else to learn and something new. So there's anytime there's a change, there's going to be some of that back and forth until people get used to it. So overall, with the training that our building department has had, uh, they have found that it has not been hard. It's just reminding everybody that they have to pay attention to something different. And we, we really want to make sure that we make it easier for the building professionals in our town because it just causes delay for our residents if they don't do it right. Thank you so much, Supervisor Calvis. Thank you to all of our roundtable and featured panelists and our speakers. Um, I asked if everyone could please uh, put your contact information in the chat so that our attendees can reach out to you with any questions. We would so appreciate that. Um, and this concludes our presentation for the day. So um, thank you again. And here is my contact information and all of our panelists' contact information is in the chat. Thank you so much. We will follow up with an email with the recorded webinar um, and with the case study um, resources to share. Thank you Thank again. You, Rachel.